This extends a little bit what we talked, this particular set of slides we're about to talk about gives an example of some of the semaphore implementation stuff we've been talking about. And uh, it just gives you a different view of what we talked about. This is going to talk about it more from a design and implementation point of view than a visualization point of view. Uh, and you'll see when we get to the FAIR implementation, I, I've done some clever things. So I'm going to actually show you a particular FAIR implementation, but it's not the one I want you to use for your implementation. I'll talk about that when we get there. OK, so this is basically the, the design of my implementation, actually based on what Mitchell had done. Um, and we'll talk more about this stuff, of course, when we talk about Java semaphores. They have yet a different implementation than all this stuff, but uh, ours will be kind of cool. So here's kind of an overview of what we've got here. We have uh, an implementation that uses the bridge pattern. Hopefully you remember the bridge pattern from CS251. If you don't remember the bridge pattern, you can go back and watch the video on the bridge pattern, which is there. But in a nutshell, the bridge pattern defines an abstraction, which is an interface, and it defines an implementation, and it allows the implementations to vary. And so it basically allows you to decouple the abstraction from the implementation so the two can vary independently. Now, in this particular case, we're going to focus primarily on implementation variation. But the way we've implemented it, you could actually have abstraction variation as well if you so chose. Th this is actually not what you get with what uh, comes out of the box with, with Java or Android, but we did it one step further. It's a little cooler. So what we have here is we have an interface called iSemaphore, which just defines the interface methods. And then we implement simple semaphore from that, but you could also implement you know, binary semaphore or some other kind of semaphore if you wanted to have different things. So you could actually have different abstraction implementations if you so chose. What we're going to do is have a single abstraction implementation, which will then have several implementation variants. So here's the class that implements this interface. And then here is the implementer hierarchy using the Gang of Four bridge pattern. And you can see we have a base class that defines certain things. And then we have a non-fair semaphore and a fair semaphore that subclass this further. And then, as you'll see in just a minute, all the methods here in the abstraction simply forward to the semaphore base, which of course either calls non-fair semaphore or fair semaphore using the bridge pattern. This is straight out of what's done in the Java implementation. All right, so let's take a look at a little bit of code. Here is iSemaphore. Very simple. We have acquire, release, acquire, uninterruptibly, and available permits. Those are just interface methods, nothing unusual there. Here is simple semaphore, which implements iSemaphore. It defines an instance of semaphore base. Semaphore base is the root of the implementer hierarchy. It defines available permits as a volatile int, and then goes ahead and stashes that away in the semaphore base. And then available permits simply returns that. So far, so good. This looks, looks more or less like your code, except you, with one exception, people didn't factor it out quite this way. Here are the implementation methods for simple semaphore, most of which are abstract. So you can see that acquire is abstract, release is abstract, but acquire uninterruptibly is kind of interesting. So let's take a look at this. Acquire uninterruptibly is actually implemented in the base class. That's kind of cool. And what you can see what it does is it goes into loop and it tries to acquire. And if it manages to acquire, it breaks out. And if it gets an interruption, <coughs> it loops back around again. So this is sort of the super duper economy sized version of this. And we stuck it in a base class. Now, let me ask you a question. What pattern are we implementing here? No? 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 You only have 21 patterns left to go. <laughs> So here's a method that has a fixed algorithm, and it leaves the implementation of one of the steps to a subclass. It's not binary, right? no. Template. Template. Template method. Very good. <laughs> Te 20 points to Gryffindor. Good job. So yes, it's template method. So this is a template method, and there's the hook method, right? And that's template method pattern. You'll see that gets used a lot. Here then is the simple semaphore constructor, as you can see. Um, what it does is it goes ahead and um, all it does is just create the appropriate subclass of the implementer hierarchy. So if it's fair, it makes a new fair semaphore with the initial permits. If it's not fair, it makes a new not fair semaphore uh, or non fair semaphore with initial permits. That's all it does. And if you think that's easy, take a look at all the methods 
for simple semaphore. All these guys do is they simply forward to the underlying semaphore implementation. So these are the public methods in the abstraction that simply forward via the bridge pattern to the, implement, the appropriate subclass in the implementer hierarchy. <coughs> so just classic bridge 101. What, take a look at the Java semaphore implementation. It works almost exactly the same way. They have a few different implementation details, but same basic pattern. So kind of cool to see the gang of four patterns used in concurrency. All right, let's talk about the, the semantics. We already discussed this before. So constructors take a fairness parameter. If it's false, then it's haphazard in terms of who gets allowed to go in. Barging is allowed and so on. Here's an implementation of the non-fair semaphore. This is the code. So here's non-fair semaphore. Everybody pretty much got this right, so I'm just going to show you the implementation. The uh, permit count is set here. Acquire comes in, grabs the intrinsic lock, checks to see if there's any permits. If there are no permits, we wait. Otherwise, we just fall right through. We acquire the permit, and then we release the, we release the lock on the way out. We release the synchronized lock. Here's the release method. That acquires the intrinsic lock increments the available permits by one. And now, we didn't talk about this last time, but if the number of available permits is now greater than zero, then we can notify. This is an optimization we can put into the code. You don't have to do this. You can always just call notify. But you really only need to call notify if state has changed from zero or less than zero to greater than zero. Because if it's gone from minus two to minus one, what's the point in waking anybody up? They can't do anything anyway, right? So this is an optimization you can put in. And then, of course, you release the lock on the way out. All right, let's talk about fair semaphore semantics. As you saw before, fairness lets you do things in FIFO order. And the subtle point here that we had talked about briefly last time, but I'll go into a little bit more detail. When you look at the implementation, you'll notice that there are certain places where you actually acquire a lock. And so it doesn't matter if the acquire method in one thread is called first. It's not acquire that's being called that matters. It's the synchronization point inside of acquire that matters. So you might have two threads. Thread one calls acquire in first in one thread. Thread two calls acquire in the second thread later. But because of the scheduling order, you actually acquire the lock in thread two before you acquire the lock in thread one. So even though acquire was called first, the actual synchronization point came later. Now, how you would ever test this out is anybody's guess, right? That would be very hard to get an accurate reading of precisely when the method got called versus the lock the method acquires gets called. But the point is that what matters is when you synchronize, not when the method is called. Any questions about that? Does that make sense? All right. So now let's take a look at a fair implementation of Java built-in monitor objects. And there's lots of different ways to do this. Uh, we're going to implement this using something that came out of Doug Lee's great book on concurrent programming in Java. And if you go here, all the source code from the book, including this implementation or a variant, because I modified a little bit of it, um, is all there. Now, I'm going to show you this code because I want to sh show you another way to do it. You're not allowed to use this implementation for your solution. Luckily, nobody even went anywhere near this approach. <laughs> so it's not going to be a, a huge sacrifice to lose this implementation. This implementation is interesting because it uses what I call a smart waiter node in order to be able to simplify a lot of the core algorithm of doing acquire and release. And you'll see how this works in a second. So we have spare semaphore, which is a semaphore base. We've got an array list of these smart wait nodes, which we call M wait Q. Uh, notice array list is not, is not synchronized, so it's a lightweight way to do this. Here's the constructor. We call up to the sub to the superclass to give it available permits, and we allocate an array list, which is unsized to begin with. Here's the acquire method. This is kind of interesting. So the first thing we're going to do when we come in is we're going to check to see if we've been interrupted. If we've been interrupted, we're going to bail out. So if someone says, I, I want this thread to shut down, we're going to be nice and, and stop. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and acquire the intrinsic lock. And if the number of permits is greater than zero, then we bail out. We're done. That's not unlike your implementation that you guys did. Notice something interesting, though. What, what is the thing that jumps to mind when you look at this implementation versus the implementation that 
99.999% of you guys were doing? What's the main thing you see that's different right off the bat? Right, so we're not starting out by creating a specific notification object, which is what we were doing in the Cargill implementation of this. Now, when I saw the Cargill implementation, I was a little bit perturbed because I thought to myself, we're always allocating this specific notification lock, but if the permits are greater than zero, we don't need it. So it was kind of a waste to allocate it. But why, again, did we need to have that lock? What was the reason why we had to grab that, grab that object, create that object first and grab the lock? Remember why we had to do that? Garbage collection? It wasn't so much garbage collection. So that it wouldn't be notified before we waited? We wouldn't be notif it wouldn't be notified and removed before we waited on it. Exactly. So you wouldn't have a situation where you allocated the object, stuck it in the queue, and before you could go ahead and wait on it, someone came along and notified it and released it. And you're like waiting forever because that, <laughs> that, that's called the missed wake up bug or missed wake up problem. So this solution is much simpler. And the reason it's much simpler is because they put the logic of avoiding releases that are out of order into the waiter node. The waiter node is now smarter. This, this guy up here, this wait, or not this guy, the, the guy over here that we looked at. Um, the thing that goes in here, the wait node, that is now smart. And we'll see how that works in a second. So we come in, all we have to do is acquire this. And we acquire this just to protect these, this data variable of M available permits. So that's safe. Otherwise, if permits are less than or equal to zero, we make a new wait node and we add that wait node to the queue. Now notice something interesting here. Notice we did this little trick I talked about before. Wait node is a local variable, which starts out as null. We set the local variable here. We add that to the wait queue. This is with the lock held, so we don't have to worry about contention. And then we release the lock here. We release the intrinsic lock. And now we're going to call wait or, or do wait on node. And this does not have to be called with the lock held. In fact, we don't want it called with the lock held. That would be bad. So that's, that's an example of what I was talking about before. Local variables don't have to be locked in order to be thread safe because they can't be contended for by other threads. So now we do a do wait call which is a smart wait on the wait node outside of the scope of the synchronized statement. And we'll look at do wait in just a second. So I think you would, argue, I think you would agree, Mitchell, would you agree, this code is a little simpler than the code that we did because we put, uh, the Doug Lee's approach puts the intelligence into this extra class. Whereas the Cargill approach, which is what we started with, is a little bit more complicated, although it's simple at one level because the wait node is easier. Yes, sir. Uh, you're going to see we don't need one. We don't need to have one. It's done elsewhere. Here's release. So release goes ahead and grabs the lock, goes into a loop, checks to see if the queue is empty. If the queue is empty, then we're done. We just increment the count by one and bail out. If the queue is not empty, we get the next item out of the queue. So that get, gets removed from the queue. And now we've got this thing. We do a smart notify. We'll look at what smart notify does. Uh, and this comes back to your question about interrupts. So when we look at do notify, we'll see that do notify checks to see whether something's been interrupted already. And if it has, it basically just returns um, false. And that'll cause us to loop back around again and, and recheck. So you skip over nodes that have been interrupted. Now, if, if, it, if it, we return, if it does in fact succeed, we return. Otherwise, the node that we got out of here was already released due to an interrupt or a timeout or something else. And so we have to go back around and retry this all over again. So that's handling. The interrupts are handled in a different place. Here's the wait node. This is that smart monitor object we're talking about before. It's got a local variable called released, which is not synchronized or not volatile. Here's do wait. Remember, do wait was called back up over here. Here's do wait. And when do wait is called, we're going to wait until the object is, is notified. This is a synchronized method, as you can see. If we were already released, this is why we don't have to have this synchronized SN lock thing like we did for the cargo implementation. We're going to keep track of being released in a different way. If we've already been released, we never bother waiting in the first place. So if we've not been released, 
then we go ahead and wait, just like we did before. So now we're waiting on, now we're waiting on the specific notification object. And if something goes wrong, it basically handles the interrupt exception by setting release to be true and stuff like that. So that's what do wait does. And then here's do notify. Remember, do notify is the thing that gets called over here. So do notify basically says, that is a note to me that we're getting close to the quiz. Um, do notify is where it gets called over here in release. And you can see what do notify does is it turns around. It's also a synchronized method. It checks to see if we've been released already. If we've been released, we return false, which alerts the caller this node is out of commission. It's been interrupted or something else has gone on with it that means it no longer matters. Otherwise, if it hasn't been uh, released yet, we set it to be released. So now we're, we're saying we're done. And then we notify the one and only, whoops, <laughs> well, we, we notify the one and only waiter that uh, we're done. Let me find that slide again and bring it up because I want to look at that quickly. And so that, that one and only notify, or we, we notify the one and only waiter here, and then we return true. So what's interesting about this is that it gives you a very different way to implement exactly the same pattern. And of course, what's easier or hard depends on a variety of different things. This solution pushes the complexity into the smart wait node, thereby simplifying acquire and release in the fair semaphore. Your solution uses the very simple wait and notify mechanisms that are built into monitor objects on an object, but that requires the surrounding code to be slightly more complicated. So just showing you can sort of get the same effect with two different ways of doing things. OK, any questions? So a couple of um, bookkeeping things, and then we'll do the quiz. So booking, bookkeeping thing number one, uh, your resubmissions are due, your resubmissions of assignment two are due before class, I do it at 3 o'clock on uh, Monday, and then I'll go over the, our solution at that time just so you'll see uh, what you can use for the peer evaluation. And I think the peer evaluation is due like three days after that, so that'll give you a chance to look at other people's code and, and learn, learn from their either triumphs or their defeats uh, how to make it better.